So welcome, welcome Diane, and Jeannie, and Walt, Kathleen, and Jimmy, and Tom, and Ron, and Talia, and Lisa, and Sophie. Is there someone in the back too, or no? Is everyone? Okay, welcome everybody. So tonight, as is our custom, given it's the first Gathering of the month, we will explore some mindfulness trainings from the Plumbalist community to engage Buddhism. And uh, two months ago, we explored the first seven of the 14 mindfulness trainings, which is an extrapolation and interpretation of the five mindfulness trainings or the five precepts. And they're laid out in grayer form and depth, and they're a modern offering of what was developed by Thich Nhat Hanh and the first members of the Order of Intervening during the American War in Vietnam when these monastic and lay friends that we need to be of service, we need to help them, it's a mess. And they developed these supports and these training guidelines. And so it's been my experience that like navigating all 14 of them at once, sitting and reading them, I, I can't repeat them anymore. And so breaking them into chunks, breaking them in half and doing the first of and then eight, 14 gives them more support. So that's what we're going to do tonight. After we sit, and then after that, we can talk about them and see, explore that a bit. <clears throat> Really have the five. Even if it had the 14, they would be out of date because they've been updated recently. It's one of the things I think is so cool about the Pumbledge community of engaged Buddhism is that it's a living, breathing organism. And there's this awareness of how do we make this the brilliance of the awakened one available to us today in this current manifestation of modern. You know, what does it mean now? How do we? navigate these practices and so it's kind of fitting that we're going to engage with these specifically 8 through 14 in June in an honoring of pride and a celebrating of pride and an honoring of all the ways that we might move the world as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender <clears throat> and the full alphabet because part of what's changed in these recently is a broadening of understanding of sexual identity. And it was a long conversation within the Pumbo's community. I think I remember six or seven years ago. So if you spend time at a monastery, a Buddhist monastery, or you've been to an Orthodox, Orthodox synagogue in the Jewish tradition or some other religious communities, they're divided along this gender binary. Right, like the men over here and the women over here, and like that's it. And so for me, there's various challenges around that. And in the Buddhist monastery, it's no different, it's like the nuns and the monks. And so, what about people who don't identify as men or don't identify as women? And there's been this conversation for quite a while now, and there's um, been a formal acknowledgement of that. And I, I think that I have it in these 14 that I've printed here. And if I don't, the electronic world will help us because it's just the, it's the last one. So we'll see. We'll see. So if, just before we settle into practice, are there any comments or questions or any way that I'm making or not making sense? Or did anything I say kind of bring anything up for you? So I want you to be able to settle and not have stuff kind of in your mind. <laughs> All right, get comfy. Find your posture. Kathleen, can you close that door for me? Yes, that little one. Thank you very much. See if the body wants to move or stretch in any ways.
finding your posture or moving or and stretching a bit more, whatever the body, whatever the body needs. I'm beginning to tune into yourself. Learning. For this practice period, would it be most supportive to sit as you are or change your posture in a small way or in a bigger way? Would it be supportive to stand up or lie down? Next week, we'll do a formal lying down practice. But for today, asking into your own heart, your own gut. And settling in to the stationary posture that's most supportive for you right now. We're not going for perfect, but rather discerning or recognizing what's most supportive right now. And then tuning in to the heart. Tuning in to the gut. Experiencing the arising and passing of each moment. Sounds, thoughts, emotions, bodily sensations. All arising and passing. <coughs> moment by moment, like the sound of my voice or the call. Or the sound of the spell. If you're in the space here. A little wake up down. And then three full invitations of the bell. Receiving the sound, rising, passing.
opening the things as they are. Allowing yourself to notice what's pleasant. Perhaps the sensation of breath as it enters the nostrils is pleasant. or maybe the warmth of the exhalation is pleasant.
Or perhaps if you consciously incline your mind in this direction, you can touch some appreciation for the fact that you are breathing. Maybe that appreciation can be felt in the heart center. Or maybe you notice a sensation on the face that we call a smile. Or maybe not. Checking it out. Is there access to some appreciation? For the simple fact of breathing, of being alive. Tuning into the heart and the gut, to this emotional core, and noticing how it feels. To appreciate, to feel gratitude or appreciate this fact of breathing and being alive. Noticing how it feels in the heart and the gut. Letting go of the story or the object and feeling into the body. I'd like to be able to. By tuning into ourselves. By tuning to this capacity, our potential to appreciate life.
And of course, this awareness of appreciation or pleasantness will subside. We can consciously bring it up again. Inclining the heart, mind, and body to notice, to be aware of what says himself. What else is here? Rosaki stuff likes to pull our attention. And we can consciously practice. Recognize, observe, and notice the present. Notice how it feels in the heart, how it feels in the gut to appreciate. Or in doing so, our ability to be with everything else, all the shit that does suck, it increases. Our resilience expands, our capacity grows. When we're able to feel more solidity and stability amidst the inevitable tosses and turns of life, we're able to have stability amid, amidst, within the inevitable chaos.
What does it feel like inside to offer yourself a little love? Dropping in, I love you. I love you just as you are. Does the body brace and resistance? Let the body soften and allow. Maybe something else happens. No, they're seeing. Noticing and allow. Okay. It's like this. Tending to yourself, your kind attention. Showing your nervous system. I am here for you.
Feeling into the heart. Reading ourselves with kind awareness, kind attention, Noticing the quality of the heart. 
reading whatever is there, tenderness and kindness. Demonstrating to your heart, mind, and body that you're here for yourself. I got you. I'm here for you. By paying attention through tuning in. By noticing what you need and meeting that need. Gradually expanding the field of awareness into movement and sight. We're noticing how it feels to move and see whatever level of sightedness you have. We'll enjoy an exploration of these mindfulness trainings. <laughs> and mostly it'll be a practice of listening. And many of you will have the opportunity to bring your voice in at some point in time. I invite you to notice how the mindfulness training or trainings land for you or don't land, right? Notice where there's resonance and dissonance and let's see, we're gonna get to talk about it in a little bit. So I'll read this. Maybe I'll change some words here and there, but this is pretty much straight from the Plum Village website. 
the 14 mindfulness trainings. The 14 mindfulness trainings are modern distillation of the traditional bodhisattva precepts of Mahayana Buddhism. And were developed by Thich Nhat Hanh and the first members of the Order of Intervening in Saigon in 1966, right in the midst of the war. Monastic and lay friends who have made a vow in a formal ceremony to receive, study, and practice or observe these 14 mindfulness trainings are known as members of the Order of Intervening or core members of the Order of Intervening. The Order of Intervene, through the Plum Village lineage of Thich Nhat Hanh, belongs to the Lin Chi or Rinzai tradition of Zen Buddhism. Thich Nhat Hanh was the 42nd generation down from Lin Chi. And I don't feel like that's something that's thought of or spoken of very much, and you might not even know who Lin Chi is, you're like, yeah, whatever, who cares? <laughs> But Lin Chi is known as Rinzai in Japan, and there's lots of um, lineages of Buddhism that he's really influenced. And maybe we'll explore that more in the future, but it's an interesting point to me that I don't think is often made. The first six members of the order were colleagues and students of Thich Nhat Hanh who worked with him. They worked together, relieving the suffering of the war. In joining the Order of Intervening, they dedicated themselves to the continuous practice of mindfulness, ethical behavior, and compassionate action in society. I mean, one thing that was really amazing to me about that community of practitioners, that community of people, is that they were like, yeah, suffering's wrong. And we're going to go, go in here, we're going to help rebuild this village, whoever's village it is, whoever bombed the village. We're going to be here and try to feed these people who are needing to be fed. And we're not taking sides. And that's one of the things that's super important in these training, just not take sides. And you just kind of reflect on your life, like how much can you not take sides? Right? It's hard. It's a practice. It's a practice. My mom so clearly sees right and wrong. And it's worth practicing, I know, I've noticed. But of course, there is no right and wrong, right? Like that's one of the things that I'm trying to learn myself. And so I sometimes talk about like, yeah, there's suffering and the absence of suffering and pain and lack of pain and lots of causes and conditions. Not so simple, it's not, it's not black and white, it's just not how it works. Today, these 14 mindfulness trainings outline a way of practicing harmoniously in community, followed by residents of all of the international monastic practice centers in a fundamental tradition. And there are now more than 2,000 lay members of the Order of Intervene active in local communities worldwide. Most of what we're going to read is from the revised version of the 14 Mindfulness Trainings that was presented by Thich Nhat Hanh at the Great Ordination Ceremony held in Plum Village in February of 2014. And as I said, there's also some changes mostly in the 14th that are or from um, 2023. All right. Followed by the bell, and someone has a Michael train that's marked number eight. So we'll start with eight. And then you'll stop reading, and I'll invite a bell, and we'll just kind of notice how it lands or doesn't land. And then when you're ready, of course, with nine, we'll start reading. And, you know, take your time. Take your time with the reading. Let yourself be in your body. Notice resonance and dissonance and pause nice and slow so that you can hear it and so that we all can hear it. And taking time for the meaning to sink in for yourself and those who are listening. Eight mindfulness training, true community and communication. Aware that lack of communication always brings separation and suffering. We are committed to training ourselves in the practice of compassionate listening 
and loving speech. Knowing that true community is rooted in its inclusiveness and in the concrete practice of the harmony of views, thinking and speech, we will practice to share our understanding and experiences with members in our community in order to arrive at collective insight. We are determined to learn, to listen deeply without judging or reacting, and refrain from uttering words that can create discord or cause the community to break. Whenever difficulties arise, we will remain in our Sangha and practice looking deeply into ourselves and others to recognize all the causes and conditions, including our own habit energies that have brought about the difficulties. We will take responsibility for all the ways we may have contributed to the conflict and keep communication open. We will not behave as a victim, but be active in finding ways to reconcile and resolve all conflicts, however small. The ninth mindfulness training, peaceful and loving speech. Aware that words can create happiness or suffering, we are committed to learning to speak truthfully, lovingly, and constructively. We will use only words that inspire joy, confidence, and hope, as well as promote reconciliation and peace in ourselves and among other people. We will speak and listen in a way that can help ourselves and others to transform suffering and see the way out of difficult situations. We are determined not to say untruthful things for the sake of personal interests or to impress people, nor to other words that may cause division or hatred. We will protect the happiness and harmony of our sangha by refraining from speaking about the faults of other persons in their absence and always ask ourselves whether our perceptions are correct. We will speak only with the intention to understand and help transform the situation. We will not spread rumors, nor criticize or condemn things of which we are not sure. We will do our best to speak out about situations of injustice, even when doing so may make difficulties for us. Like Red Mexico. Tenth mindfulness training, protecting and nourishing the Sangha. Aware that the essence and aim of the Sangha is the practice of understanding and compassion, we are determined not to use the word for personal power of God or transform our community into a political insert. As members of a spiritual community, we should nonetheless take a clear stand against oppression and injustice. We should strive to change the situation without taking sides in a conflict. We are committed to learning to look with the eyes of a future being and to see ourselves and others as cells in one solid body. As a true cell in the solid body, generating mindfulness concentration and insight to nourish ourselves in the whole community. Each of us is at the same time a cell in the human body. We will actively build brotherhood, 
and sisterhood, grow as a river and practice to develop three real powers understanding, love, and cutting through afflictions. She realized collectively. Right, Aware that great violence and injustice have been done to our environment and society, we are committed not to live in a vocation that is harmful to human nature. Those who are best to select the livelihood that contributes to the well being of all species on earth and helps realize our ideal of understanding and compassion. Aware of economic, political, and social realities around the world, as well as our interrelationship with ecosystems, they are determined to behave responsibly as consumers and investors. We will not invest in or purchase from companies that contribute to education and that can be sustainable from the earth or deprive others of the children. The 12th mindfulness training, reverence for life. Aware that much suffering is caused by war and conflict, we are determined to cultivate nonviolence, compassion, and the insight of interbeing in our daily lives and promote peace education, mindful mediation, and reconciliation within families communities, ethnic and religious groups, nations, and in the world. We're committed not to kill and not to let others kill. We will not support any act of killing in the world, nor thinking or in our way of life. We will diligently practice deep looking within our Sangha to discover better ways to protect life, prevent war, and build peace. The 13th mindfulness training, generosity. Aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, stealing, and oppression, we are committed to cultivating generosity in our way of thinking, speaking, and acting. We will practice loving kindness by working for the happiness of people, animals, plants, and minerals, and sharing our time energy and material resources with those who are in need. We're determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. We will respect the property of others, but we'll try to prevent others from profiting from human suffering or the suffering of other beings.
I wonder if someone from Zoom land would be interested in reading the 14th. Um, I can try reading that one. Awesome. The 14th Mindfulness Training, True Love for lay members. Aware that sexual desire is not love and that sexual relations motivated by craving cannot dissipate the feeling of loneliness, but will create more suffering, frustration, and isolation, we're determined not to engage in sexual relations without mutual comfort, without mutual understanding, love, and a deep long-term commitment. We resolve to find spiritual support for the integrity of our relationships from family members, friends, and Sangha with whom there is support and trust. We know, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that to preserve the happiness of ourselves and others, we must respect the rights and commitments of ourselves and others. Recognizing the diversity of human experience, we are committed not to discriminate against any form of gender identity or sexual orientation. Seeing that body and mind are interrelated, we are committed to learning appropriate ways to take care of our sexual energy and cultivating loving kindness, compassion, joy, and inclusiveness for our own happiness and the happiness of others. We must be aware of future suffering that may be caused by sexual relations. We will treat our bodies with compassion and respect. We are determined to look deeply into the four nutriments and learn ways to preserve and channel our vital energies, sexual, breath, spirit, for the realization of our bodhisattva ideal. We will do everything in our power to protect children from sexual abuse and to protect couples and families from being broken by sexual misconduct. We will be fully aware of the responsibility of bringing new lives into the world and will meditate regularly upon their future environment. Uh, do you want me to continue reading regarding monastic members? No, thank you, that was great. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your practice of listening and sharing. <clears throat> I'd love to hear anything that might might be alive in you as a result of listening to these or reading the one that you read or maybe even going back to our practice when I would incline us like to notice the pleasance for the sake of being able to be with the shit, right? It's not to the exclusion of the difficulties of life, it's to increase our resilience, to increase our capacity to be with the inevitable challenges of life. So yeah, we'd love to hear from anyone, anything, resonance, dissonance, all of it. So welcome.